Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. I am so blessed and honored to be your host this week. My name is Jeremy Pearsons. Now, listen to me. We have a week of broadcasts ahead of us that you do not want to miss. Let's pray. We're going to get right into the Word of God today. Father, we worship you today with this broadcast, Lord. We bring this before you and we honor you with it, Father. I'm asking today that as we get into your Word, as we come boldly before your Word, I'm asking you that you would grace us and grant us eyes that see Jesus, ears that hear His voice, the voice of our Good Shepherd, and hearts that understand who we are in Jesus and who Jesus uh, is in us. We worship you and we praise you today in Jesus name. Amen. Now listen to me. You and I are in for it because today on this broadcast and all week long, we are blessed and honored to have Pastor Joseph Prince all the way from Singapore right here on the Believer's Voice of Victory. Welcome, oh, sir. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a blessing. And thank Brother Copeland and Sister Gloria for Absolute, this honor. Absolutely. Um, I, I just got to speak with my grandfather for a few minutes, not, you know, just a few days ago. Told him you were in town and I said, I, I've never asked to do broadcast <laughs> or never asked to host yeah. anybody, but I, I felt like the Lord was in this and I just said, mm. Pastor Joseph's here. I know he loves you. I know that he loves your ministry. And you guys, I, I, I wanted our uh, viewers and our partners to know that you guys have been partners together for yes. a long time now. Yes. And uh, this has been a ministry I know that's been a blessing to you. And I know that your ministry mm -hmm. has been a blessing to them. So he said, go for it. Okay, let's go for let's it. Let's go for it. <laughs> so all this week on this broadcast, we're going to get into the Word together. Uh, and those of you who don't know, uh, maybe you've been hiding under a rock somewhere for the last several years, but Pastor Joseph uh, pastors New Creation Church in Singapore. Uh, this outstanding, growing, thriving church. Uh, and I, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about the church. And then too, we've got some pictures of the new building that the Lord has just blessed you guys yes. with. And, and let us know what's going on there. Well, last Christmas, uh, we moved into our new building. Uh, it took us about five years to build that building. It's called The Star. And uh, we work together with uh, a retail site. Uh, so there's shopping on the lower floors, but we're on the upper floor. And we have the whole auditorium. Mm. As you can see on the screen, this is our building. Uh, the Star Pack, Star, Star Performing Arts um, uh, Convention Hall for acts that come through Singapore. So we can lease out as well wow. during the weekdays and make money off the world. It's a beautiful place, yeah. <laughs> Let's look at some of these pictures. I wanted them to see. Uh, go ahead and scroll through those guys. I want you to see. What, what are we looking at here? I guess this is still the outside of the building. And yes, this is the outside it's, of the building. I think people look at this and think, is, is this yeah. an actual place? Yeah, or? it's an actual place. <laughs> it's from the future. It is on location. It's this beautiful. is by night. Wow. All right. And, and, and this, this is, is the, stop, the auditorium itself. Praise Jesus. Okay. Look That's at that That's my place. congregation. This is a, our Christmas celebration. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I miss home already. I know you do. <laughs> well, we are very blessed to have you today, sir. I know as we tape these broadcasts, you guys have been in the States for the last month. One month, yeah. A month. And uh, I know you've had a fruitful time here. Yes. And you're probably ready to get home and see your beautiful yes. wife and your two and my, beautiful kids. My one and a half year old, he's, yeah. uh, he's picking up words that uh, I missed when I was here. And there's like a growth spurt. You yeah. know what it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah, at this age. And uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting, raring to go home, man. Well, almost, but you're family. not home. Yet. Last burst of fire. Let's do right it here. right here, Pastor. Uh, I, I've, I do want to say this before we get into the word. I know you get a lot of testimonies from a lot of people. Uh, I was reading your latest book, The Power of Right Believing, and there's so many testimonies, one right after another. But uh, I've never really had the opportunity to share with you or to say publicly my personal testimony. Uh, of how the Lord has impacted m my life, my wife and I, Sarah, our family, our home, our ministry, mm -hmm. through what He's done through you. And it's, um, it's something that has really shaped the course of our ministry. In 2009, I was getting ready to preach. My dad was traveling and he asked me to preach on a Sunday and I prepared a message and I sat back and looked at it and thought, well, that's boring. And I knew if it bored me to prepare it, then it was going to bore the people mm -hmm. <laughs> that had to hear it. And... Um, just in, in a time of preparation that day, I heard this come up in my heart, just preach Jesus. Beautiful. I didn't even really know what that meant. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. well, that sounds great. Well, what, what do I say what, about this or about that? And he said, mm -hmm. just preach Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was alarmed at how ill-prepared I was for that. Mm -hmm. And, but the Lord, you know, He's gracious and He's merciful and He helped me with that. And what I thought was a message 
I realized was my wife and I, Sarah and I, we realized it was our ministry. And we found ourselves in Colossians chapter one, where he said, Him we preach. Amen. And that's what we uh, set out to do. And it was just a couple of months after that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I was familiar with you, but it wasn't really listening much. And we came across you on television and that same thing rose up on the inside. I said, that's it. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Just preach Jesus. And I asked the Lord, well, what about, what about preaching healing? Mm -hmm. He said, preach Jesus and watch what happens. Amen. What about preaching prosperity? He said, preach Jesus mm -hmm. and watch what happens. So mm -hmm. can you imagine what we're going to talk about on this broadcast this week? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. Will you get us into the Word, sir? Yes. Let's do um, it. You know, I, I think that one of the best places to start off in the Word of God is Romans chapter 5 and on the power of right believing. Uh, when we come to Romans 5, we find there, I mean, Romans 5 is precious. Um, it has so many truths that we are still digesting and feeding on. Sure. I think probably uh, even our lifetime here on earth, we're not able to finish off everything that's in Romans chapter 5. If you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Okay? Now, we see here that sinners are sinners not because they sin. Mm. They are sinners because of one man's disobedience. Adam's sin made them sinners. Mm. Therefore, they sin because they are sinners. All right? Now, also by one man's obedience, and that'll be the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Jesus. Okay? By his obedience, many will be made righteous. Now, the thing is this, the essence of the warfare is here. The devil wants us focused on our righteousness or the lack of it. Okay? He wants us focused on, are you righteous enough? Are you obedient enough? Are you holy enough? And even when you, you attempt to be holy, he says that it's not enough. Right. You know, you study the scriptures, he will say, so and so studies five chapters. You only study two chapters. Right. You study five chapters, somebody else studies 10 chapters. You pray one hour, somebody else prays three hours. He always point to you, even when you do right, he will point to you it's not enough. When you do wrong, of course he tells you it's wrong. Right. Okay, so the devil is always keeping you self-occupied. But in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, verse 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing. And watch this, bringing to captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And not our obedience, but the obedience of Christ. So the right. essence of the warfare is to have our thoughts focus on the obedience of Christ. Right, the devil wants it focused on you. But the Lord wants our, our focus to be on one man's obedience, that man's obedience that made us righteous mm -hmm. at the cross. All right, he obeyed God at the cross. That's that one act that made us righteous. Now, the thing is this, the amazing thing in the body of Christ, what I see is that um, we preach to the sinner, okay? Now, there's no good or righteous thing that you can do to undo the fact that you're a sinner. Okay, isn't that what we preach? Sure. We tell people, once you're a sinner, okay, unless you're born again, all right, you can do good, you can give to charity or whatever you do, it cannot undo the fact you're a sinner. But now that Christ, His obedience has made us righteous, we can undo our righteousness in one day. <laughs> all right, in other words, uh, you can be righteous in the morning and be unrighteous in the evening and then get yourself re-righteous before night falls, you know, and, and something right. is wrong. Yeah. And we are not even talking about much more yet. We're not even talking about much more yet. We're talking about Jesus, the second Adam and the first Adam on, on the same ground, mm -hmm. on, equal found, on equal footing. Something is wrong. We are not giving a value to the work of the second Adam, yeah. where we exalt the work of the first Adam. What he did was so powerful, we cannot undo the fact that we are a sinner. But what Christ did, we can undo it. Mm. So I think that it all must start here to realize that obe uh, righteousness, you know, the Bible talks about obedience. I believe in obedience, but Paul talks about obedience in chapter one of Romans mm -hmm. and the last chapter of Romans. He talks about obedience like this, obedience to the faith. To the faith, yeah. It is right believing. It's not this legalistic obedience. In fact, when you have right believing, for example, you believe that it is that one man's obedience that made you righteous, okay? That is right believing. Mm -hmm. And right believing will always produce right living. Yeah. 
Just preaching right living from the pulpit does not necessarily Which we're produce. Good at. Yes. Yeah. And and I've been I, I I grew up in a church where I got saved when I was I was very young. Uh, my aunt brought me to Christ and and ever since I was saved, I hear sermons, a lot of sermons. In fact, I can remember hearing a sermon about the finished work. It's all about what you need to do, right. all right? It's about right living. But I can see that in, in the pews, there's not much right living. <laughs> sure. and, but people are sincere. I really come from a perspective where I believe, uh, Jeremy, that the body of Christ is not looking for a way to sin. Mm -hmm. They are looking for a way out of sin. That's right. Yeah. I don't look at them negatively. And I think it's, it's time for us to also realize that like when Jesus saw the multitudes, all right, in, in, in the Gospels, the Bible says when Jesus saw the multitude, He was moved with compassion because they were scattered mm -hmm. and they were fainting yeah. as sheep without a shepherd. Whereas when we look at a multitude, what do we see? They are scattered because they lack, they lack discipline. Mm -hmm. They are fainting because uh, they are just disobedient. You know what I'm saying? Is that how we look at the multitude? Jesus didn't look at them that way. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And then the Bible says, and he began to teach them yeah. many things. Coming out of compassion for them rather yes. than anything else. And, and feed them, don't beat them. Yeah. You know? So that's where I, I come from, from yeah. that perspective of one man's obedience. Yeah. And I hear you say this, uh, and this has been a major theme throughout your ministry, and especially in this, this uh, new book that you've written, The Power of Right Believing, and that is that this desire that we have, and it's the right desire, it's the right desire. To, to live lives that Sincere, yeah. bring glory to God, Amen. that are that are separate, which is the definition of the word holiness, just right. separated. Right. But what it comes down to is where do you get the power to do that? Exactly. Because if you do what we've been doing for so long, which was mm -hmm. lean on the our own strength to do it, right. we've been frustrated. That's right. So what what the Lord is having you minister, and I want you to say it again and really elaborate it on it, is right believing produces right living. Amen. If we look at uh, Galatians chapter 5, we see the fruit of the Spirit. All right, in Galatians chapter 5, we see uh, Paul speaking by, teaching by the Spirit, all right, elucidating on, 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 on the gifts, of, I mean, the fruit of the Spirit. All right, you find the list here in Galatians chapter 5, okay? All right, we have the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all right, in verse 22, mm -hmm. all right, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Notice it's called the fruit of the Spirit, okay? The verses before that in verse 19, now the works, it's not called the fruit of the flesh, it's called mm -hmm. the works of the flesh. And what is works compared to fruit? Works is a result of effort. Mm -hmm. Fruit is a result of life. Wow. Okay, so... For the first four chapters of Galatians, Paul talked about law and grace, law and grace, law and grace, law and grace. And then in chapter 5, he talks about, now if you are under grace, the fruit will be love, joy, peace. Even self-control, temperance is a fruit. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. You know? But if you are under law, the works of the flesh is adultery, party spirit, bitterness, unforgiveness, witchcraft, all these are the works of the flesh. Um, I like to illustrate like this. If you look at Israel, you know, when they came out of Egypt on the night of the Passover, they were laden with gold, yeah. right? But they had no temptation. They, they had no desire to build a golden calf. Before the Red Sea, they were not tempted. Through the Red Sea, and on the other side, they were not tempted. All the way to the foot of Mount Sinai, they were not tempted until they said, the works come in, yeah. all right? Well-meaning, like you said, Jeremy, sincere, the most, all that God said, but they didn't realize it was a statement of pride. Right. All that God has said to us, we will do. And it sounds... It sounds good, it sounds, sounds noble. Great. But in the Hebrew, it's, it literally says, kol asher dibir adonai na'ase. Na'ase is an emphatic, we can do it. They have, they've not even heard the Ten Commandments. Yeah. But they told God, we can do it. And the moment they said they can do it, okay, God changed His tone. Wow. God said to them, Moses, tell them don't come near. Now, God never had that tone. All of a sudden, there's distance. You see, from, from Egypt, God was with them to the Red Sea and all that in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night. But all of a sudden, God changed His tone. Why? Man has presumed on his own righteousness. Wow. And God brought... Israel out, not because they were good, but because he was good. 
It was not because they were faithful, it's because he is faithful. It was based on the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is an unconditional covenant. Mm -hmm. Okay, but at the foot of Mount Sinai, in essence, when they said those words, all the Lord says, we can do it, they were actually exchanging covenants. It was almost like, God, don't, don't bless us, don't assess us anymore based on your goodness, but our goodness. Yeah. No longer on your faithfulness, but on our faithfulness. We can do it. And the moment, the moment they did that, God changed His stone. And the next chapter, God gave them the Ten Commandments. Okay, what's the result? You see a golden calf. Yeah. They had the gold all the time. I mean, Egypt gave them the back pay yeah. <laughs> of all the years of slavery plus interest, all right? But notice they never used that gold in this manner. Yeah. But the moment they, they put themselves under law, the strength of sin is the law. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The moment they put themselves under law, they broke the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Something that had there was a golden calf. never been a thought. Yes. Never been a temptation, never been a, <laughs> even logical to them. That's All right. of a sudden, you're saying when they, when they, you're talking about the power of right believing, well, right. this would be wrong believing. That's right. I can do that. I can do that. And like a kid would say it, I can do that without anybody helping me, mm. which is funny and cute when it's a little kid, but yes. not so much when it's me and you telling That's the right. Lord, I can do this. When so, when so obviously we can't. Yes. But something that had never been a temptation to them all of a sudden. Yeah. And I venture to say this uh, along those lines. Uh, I think that there are believers who never committed some sins that they have committed when they were, a sin when they were sinners. Hmm. But after they came to church, all right, all of a sudden some th temptations became really strong. And I think they got to check their believing. You know, we have, we have, uh, one of the ways you, you know you have wrong believing, okay, is when you, you have a toxic emotion, okay, like fear, guilt. You can't tell you have a wrong believing. You might even think that everything is okay, you believe right, but whenever you have emotions of fear, guilt, own up to it. Mm -hmm. There's a wrong believing somewhere because why are you fearful? There is a wrong thinking. Why is there wrong thinking? There is a wrong believing. Okay. And many a times the wrong believing is because of wrong hearing. Yeah. In going through this book and listening to uh, what the Lord's saying through you, um, you, ha you help identify um, things that we need to see the right way, seeing the way God sees, and then seeing what He doesn't see. Yeah. And I, as these broadcasts continue through the week, mm -hmm. I really want us to get into that. But um, one of the foundation scriptures for that is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that talks about not being conformed to this world, but being right. transformed. Yes. Of course, conformed just simply means taking on an outward appearance that's mm -hmm. not reflective of what's going on inside. Sure. Mm -hmm. But transformation is letting the inside come out. Mm -hmm. um, and he says to do that by the renewing of our mind. That's right. Um, the renovation of it, mm -hmm. which would mean you take out things that don't belong and you put things in that do. Excellent. That's right. yeah. Help us identify some of those things. What are, you talked about some of those indicators, fear, Guilt, fear, guilt, condemnation, condemnation uh, let's, anxiety, let's, depression. Let's do some renovation. Let's pull some stuff out right now before mm -hmm. we put some stuff in that belongs there. Help us identify some of these things that don't belong. Yeah, uh, for as I mentioned those things and you mentioned very eloquently just now all those things that we need to be. You see, uh, this can being conformed to the world is not your, your dressing or your, the length of your hair or your makeup, how thick it is. I mean, do you think makeup, having makeup is wrong for a lady? I think uh, if you, your face needs makeup, go for it. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? Uh, well, how much makeup do you think a lady needs, you know, depending on her face, <laughs> yeah. you, know? <laughs> you know? Let's you know. make no rules yeah, let, or laws. Yeah, so, so the world is not that. The world is the pride, the lust mm -hmm. of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. And notice what the, what the Word of God says about the world, be not conformed to the world. It says, it says that love not the world, nor the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father, mm -hmm. not the love for, for the Father. Right, right. The love of the Father is not in him. Wow. And most people think that when people, you know, they are, con they are conformed to the world is because they don't love God enough. But what God is saying, you know, if you read, read it right, is love of the Father is not in him. He doesn't know how much he's loved. Yeah. No one has been preaching to him. No one has been telling him how much he's loved. Now, we all preach the love of God, but I think we have not plumb into the depths of the length, the breadth, the height. Yeah. And our sermons is always like a mixture. Yeah, God loves you, but. God loves you, but. Imagine doing that to your wife. You know, it's easy to love Sarah, but imagine doing that to anybody else, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like there's never 
a, sec a sense of security in that relationship. Sure. Okay? So when, if we give security to our people, I believe they will not love the world. Yeah. That's what I feel like needs to come out, not just in these broadcasts, but now in the world, is that it's, you are so deeply, madly, passionately loved by the Father. Amen. And it sounds so simple, and it is so simple. Yes. It's beautifully simple. Yes. Uh, but that's when fear gets driven out. Right. That's what I want to happen uh, in these broadcasts as we continue this week. Going to get into the Word of God, but there's one thing I want you to walk away with more than anything else, and that is this. You are loved by your Heavenly Father. You are loved Amen. by the Lord Jesus. And that's what I want us to really begin to dive into because that's going to rip out some of those ways of thinking that don't yes. belong. Amen. Um, what would you say, we have just a moment left on this broadcast, what would you say that would sort of get us into where we're going from here. We're, we're taking out things that don't belong, putting things in. We want to see the way God sees. How would you wrap this up for today? I think we're going to talk about, uh, you know, many things during this week about how God is not angry with you and that, yeah. that is not being emphasized. And the sense of God's love, for example, is tied up with the fact that there's a lot of wrong believing in so many areas, you know. And I find that uh, we, we say we are word people, but then when these words are being expressed, even grace itself, it's amazing how we, we are actually, like think Brother Jerry Savelle said it very well, we are favorite word. Mm, we need yeah. to be open this coming week yeah. to all these new aspects of uh, learning. You know, I'm still a, a, a learner, you know, and, and so are you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's learn as much as we can about the grace of God because the new covenant is not about us. It's all about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Amen. And I'm so glad for that. If it was about us, this thing would have been over a long over time a ago. Long time ago. <laughs> Listen, it's not about you. It's not about what you've done or haven't done. It's about Jesus, what He's done, and do you believe what He's done? We're finding out some things from the Word of God about, number one, who God really is. You know, you got to let God define Himself and not let tradition or some other man's opinion define it. But then find out who you are in Him. Find out who you are in Jesus. And we, uh, we started yesterday's broadcast by looking at Romans chapter 5, which, yes. which I, I love Romans chapter 5. I heard uh, Judah Smith say it like this. He said, I don't do drugs. I do Romans chapter 5. <laughs> and uh, yeah. somehow the Spirit of God got the entire New Testament in right, one chapter. Right, yeah. And <laughs> talking about um, elevating the work of Jesus. Amen. It does Amen. not belong on the same level mm. as what Adam did. Right. It, but it, it is much more. Yes. What God has done for us, in us, is doing through us, mm -hmm. His grace is much more yes. than what much sin more. did to man. Amen. And um, I, I believe that there's so much that needs to be said about this. And, and my grandfather said something not long ago. I heard him say it in a meeting. Uh, talking about some of these things. He said, you know, this, this revelation of the grace of God, it's, it's been in the body of Christ. Mm. It's been here since it yes. was written. Yes. He said, but right now, I love the way he said this. He said, right now, God's got the big light on it. Mm. Isn't that good? That's very good. He's got the big light on it. In other yes. words, through ministries like yours so and good. what you're doing and, and what the Lord's doing through you, the Lord is shining a light on this. Mm -hmm. I believe it's because we need to hear it. And I know mm. when when um, I first got turned on to your ministry and was reading your books and listening to your teaching, you know what it did for me as somebody who grew up in a, it, well, I call it this, the household of faith. <laughs> it, it came in and just reinforced everything I believed. Mm -hmm. um, and what it, what it helped me with was said, okay, that's why I believe this. Mm, the why you believe That's it. why I can lay mm -hmm. hold of the things of God and claim it for my life right. and my family and my marriage, my ministry. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe a revelation of mm -hmm. who Jesus really is. When the, yes. when the light comes on and the cover comes off and mm -hmm. you see Him, we will be like Him. Right. when we see Him as He is. Yes. And uh, sir, I, I'd ask again today that you just get us into the Word of God and mm -hmm. minister to the people watching this broadcast all over the world, whatever mm -hmm. the Lord would have you say. Okay, let's go back to Romans chapter 5. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> In Romans chapter 5, there is a verse that I want to call your attention to. And this is the verse, probably the number one verse that I think that is... Uh, still neglected, you know, and, and such a powerful truth built on these power twins, I call it. All right, in Romans 5, verse 17, and my book, uh, The Power of Right Believing, has so many testimonies of people, all right, who put into practice this one verse, okay? 
especially when they are in addictions to mm -hmm. depression or eating disorders, anxiety attacks, you know, um, pornography. We have many testimonies of, of people, all right, who suffered from um, uh, eating disorders and addictions to pornography mm -hmm. especially, who found freedom. Wow. Okay? And how they found it is this, I teach that while you are still in bondage, all right, confess, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise God. You see, when, when, when there are symptoms of lack in our, our bodies, okay, us, uh, in our lives, we confess, my God supplies. Right. All right, if there are symptoms in our bodies, we confess, we don't confess the symptoms, right. we confess by His stripes, I am healed. When we sin, we confess our sin. Right. We never rise above it. As in everything, all right, everything in the Christian life works by faith, okay? When it comes to sin, we're not using our faith. We're confessing what's there. And I have a whole teaching. I know that, uh, you know, uh, for some people, it's a huge controversial issue and all that, but to me, it's very simple, all right? Um, when you confess uh, the righteousness of God, who Christ has made you, it honors the Father. Mm -hmm. It glorifies Jesus because of His finished work. Yeah. And so I have people that we, we teach uh, from Romans 5, 17, while you are still smoking, they'll still do it. Yeah. While you're still watching that pornography, they'll still do it and not tell their pastors about it. Confess, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, Jeremy, the last thing you right want to do, it, yeah. right in the middle of it, the last thing you want to do while you're smoking is to feel like a hypocrite because the devil's going to come and tell you, what did you just say? Yeah. You know, you are such a hypocrite. He does not want you to say that. But I've got so many testimonies in that book, all right, that where they confess that they are the righteousness of God, of God in Christ, people are addicted to pornography, lifelong habits, you know, broken, just not a matter of overnight, but uh, many of them came on confessing and they say that, Pastor Prince, just let you know, I was addicted to pornography. One young man in New York said he was uh, bound by pornography since the age of 13. Wow. And, and after he became a believer, he's now in his 20s, he said that he's still bound by it, but uh, he used his willpower as much as he could to overcome it. It grew worse. Yeah. But he says, the moment I confess I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, I began to confess again and again, even in the midst of it. Yeah. Just let you know. And many of them will share things like, after uh, a few months, after a year of not watching pornography, then they wrote to me, this thing is real. Wow. I I'm a living testimony that grace is the antidote yeah. to sin. And people, it's a desire from within. People look at that and they think, how, how could there be that kind of power in just saying something like that? But the word confession itself just means to say the same thing. As, Homologio, say the same just thing. Just say the That's same right. thing. And, it, and you have to realize if there was no power in confession, then none of us would be born again. Mm. Because that's how we were born again. That's we right. said the same thing about Jesus right. that God said about Him. Amen. God gave him that place as Lord and we said the same thing. Well, that's the same thing you're doing in the middle of that sin. Right. I'm going to say about me what he has said about me. Yeah. And it's the power of agreement. And it's called righteousness by faith because, you know, there are times you wake up in the morning and you won't feel righteous. You feel yeah. like some goose, you know, or some, <laughs> you know, you feel unclean. Sometimes you wake up feeling unclean. You might have some bad, you know, dreams or whatever, but that's a time to confess by faith. I am the righteousness of Amen. God in Christ. And we've been talking about the verse. Let's, let's read that verse in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, For if by the one man's offense, we know that this is Adam's offense, death reigned through the one. Much more, look at that, mm. much more, those who receive, and this word receive in the Greek is a, is a present active tense, which means continually receive. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we need to always get born again, born again, you know, but what it means is that a continual consciousness, mm -hmm. especially when you sin, that's the time you need to it's confess. It's always working. Yes. It's so, the word receive here in the Greek is a present continuous, lambano, present continuous tense. Those who receive two things, abundance of grace. Well, this pastor prince, sometimes he, you know, he preaches too much on grace. Here it says, it's by the abundance of grace. Yeah. And the other gift, of the, the gift, gift of, of righteousness. righteousness. Notice it's not the reward of righteousness for something, you, it's the gift. Through these two power twins, all right, those who receive these two will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now, notice that if you receive the abundance of grace actively every moment, you know, every day you are, you are conscious of that and you receive that and the gift of righteousness, you will reign in life. When mm. you reign, the devil doesn't. That's so good. When you reign, your addictions don't. That is so good. You can have two persons reigning, you know. Yeah. When you reign, your bad habits don't. And, and if, 
if I were the devil, and I'm not the devil, he's not, <laughs> he's not this good looking, but, uh, <laughs> but if, if I were the devil, yes, which teaching would I attack? These two, sure. abundance of grace. I will attack any ministry, any minister that preaches too much on grace. Yeah. Number two, I will attack the teaching of the gift of righteousness. I'll make it appear like righteousness is something you attain as, as opposed to obtain, mm -hmm. all right? And I will attack these two because I know that if the body of Christ ever wakes up to these two gifts, yeah. that's it, they will reign over me. Wow. I, I do know this. I know that there's somebody or multiple people watching these broadcasts that are dealing with those exact things that you named, uh, uh, fear that they can't seem to get rid of, addictions that they can't seem to get rid of, uh, just being held in that bondage. And you need to know today as you're watching this, that this is your freedom. There is freedom in the middle of this. I read that in your book just, just last night. And it's so simple. And I, how many times have I read Romans 5? But when you said, when you reign, Addiction doesn't. Mm. When you reign, fear doesn't. That's right. Oh, that is so powerful. Mm. I'm so thankful. Mm. <laughs> I'm so thankful for Romans chapter 5. <laughs> it's all because of Jesus. Of it's through Him. Yeah. And it's through Him alone. Absolutely. And, and Jeremy, the thing is that for the body of Christ, you know, we, we've learned this. I mean, I, I thank God for, for, you know, teachers like Brother Copeland, mm -hmm. you know, Br Brother Hagen, and Brother E.W. Canyon. You know, they, they taught uh, that righteousness is a gift. Yeah. You know, you hardly hear that preach. And, and therefore, if you don't preach righteousness as a gift, guess what? You're not preaching the gospel. Yeah. You know, we hear a lot of uh, uh, preaching, you've got to be more righteous. Whenever I hear people saying you've got to be more righteous, I know that they are missing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Bible says, this is how you can tell a babe in Christ. For he that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So you can always tell someone is a babe when they are unskillful in that word righteousness. When you tell them, Define for me what is righteousness. Or you see the way they describe mm -hmm. righteousness, they, they describe it as a behavior or works righteousness. You know that they're a bit. Or something that you can fall in and out of. That's right. Yeah. That means they are still using milk. But if they define righteousness as a gift, then they are going beyond babyhood stage. Yeah. Wow. All right. So uh, um, righteousness is not something that you can lose. Mm -hmm. That is something I want to come on strong. All right. If you can lose righteousness, you can lose Jesus. Okay. The thing is this, you know, when you were a sinner, could you renounce your sinnership? The fact that you're a sinner. Can I, can I, with my free choice, people say, well, Pastor Prince, if somebody just renounced, you know, God understands and knows the, the weakness of people. All right. He knows why they say what they said under pressure. Okay. We are not to judge them. Right. Okay. But can I, as a sinner, I say, I renounce the fact that I am a, I'm a sinner. Will that happen? Hmm. But I'm using my free choice. Can right. a sinner use his free choice? I'm using my free choice to renounce my sinnership. <laughs> Will that happen? Hmm. So free choice is not as, as powerful as we make it to be. What's going to happen when, when a believer under pressure or whatever, he renounces, you know, his faith or Jesus and all that. We're not to judge who, who is safe, who is not. But, but the thing is that if he renounces even his faith, does he become unsaved? Well. All right. So if he can, then what Adam did is more powerful again than what Jesus yeah. did. It's bringing what Jesus did back down to that back level. Back down to that level. But this said much more. Yes. Much, much more. We, and we have not even plumbed the depths of the on equal footing, yeah. let alone the much more. How can we teach on the much more? It is much more, Jeremy, because of the value and the preciousness of that one man. Thank you. It is like, like God paid, like, like our sin is like, for example, one million debt. One million dollar debt to God. God. You know what God did? God paid for us the debt, but He gave us a hundred billion dollar debt. He paid off our one million yeah. debt. Because the man, if you know the value of that man, all right, he's an overpayment yes, he for all our sins. If there are other planets, other universes where there are other sinners, His blood still avails for them. That's why He can die for all those who lived before He lived, before He walked on the earth. He could die for all those in the future and beyond yeah. because of the value of that one man, Christ Jesus. And if my debt's paid, why do I need to keep paying on a debt? Yes. And, and, and you know what? The, the amazing thing I find in my life is that uh, when I know I'm forgiven as it is, I can be honest about my sins. You know, sometimes I drive down the road and I get a little bit impatient with the, you know, and I, no. and, 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 oh, I do, yes, <laughs> you know. Where's Sarah? Okay, any, anyway, the thing is this, um, you know, and, and 
the thing is that I used to be defensive. My wife says, you know, darling, you're driving a bit too fast and you're a bit impatient. And I say, I'm not impatient. I'm a man of God. I'm a man of rest, you know. <laughs> but the thing is this, once I realized all my sins, have, those are the early days in my, in my you know, sure, uh, long marriage. Sure, yeah, long, long time ago. Long yeah, but, uh, but once I realized that my sins are forgiven, as it is, okay, I can just smile at her and say, I, I, I did that again, didn't I? There's no need to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. You know why? It's like, like a ledger. I, I have this illustration in my book. If, if a businessman has a ledger, all right, his accounts ledger, and he's heavily in debt, okay, when he comes into the office, he doesn't want to look at the ledger. He tells his secretary, just pay what you can, okay? He doesn't want to see the red. Yeah. Why? It reminds him of how much in debt he is. Yeah. But supposing someone hears his friend, a, a wealthy friend, hears about his predicament, pays off his debt. He goes into the office the next week, he opens up all right, his ledger to see all the red and realize, he didn't realize he was that heavily in debt. Now he's filled with gratefulness mm. to his benefactor. Yeah. He doesn't, wow, look at all that I owe. <laughs> I didn't know I owe that much, you know, and it's all paid for. Yeah. In other words, what I'm saying is that people become, you know, open with their sins, with one another. There's no need to defend yourself, no need to try to, you know, you found me out, you know, yeah. the kind of thing. Even like I said, you know, I can drive down the road. Wendy will say, hey, you lost your cool a little bit. I say, yeah, again, I did that. Pray for me, darling. <laughs> you know, you can have that relationship and yeah. it's, it's, it's peaceful. It's yeah. wonderful to have that kind of uh, relationship with God. And it's, it's a, uh, the light has got to come on for a believer that when they do miss it, yeah. like you're talking about, when, they're, when they do sin, oh, God's so angry with me now. Mm -hmm. God's so upset with me. Is that, is that true? Is that how it is? That's what I used to believe, you yeah. know. You're looking at a man, all right, you're looking at a, at a man who in his teenage years believed he had committed the unpardonable sin and would confess his sins almost every moment. Because I really believe that God is angry with me and I believe that uh, I need to get right with God. No one told me about all these truths and, and this is, was, you know, through blood, sweat and tears, I would say, you know, uh, my life testimony. That's why I appreciate this truth so much. But you see, I think that people who appreciate grace are people who have really, really, really tried hard. Mm. They've done everything they can and they've fallen flat. They know they can't. Mm. Those who still say, well, we can keep the law are those who have not really, uh, you know, God will say to them, well, another lap around the mountain. Yeah. You know, you've not learned the lesson. So we need to know we are forgiven of all our sins, past, present and future. Praise the Lord. That gives you a, a rest. Yeah. Not that you want to sin. You see, those who say, well, Pastor Prince, if you preach that to the people, there's no telling what they'll do. You're giving people license to sin. You know, Dad Hagen, your, your dad will always, your granddad will always yeah. say, you know, yeah. uh, you don't have to give people license to sin, right? <laughs> sinning before they have yeah. license. Yeah, amen. So the thing is that Jesus didn't believe that. Obviously, Jesus taught, all right, that that woman who, who wept at his feet and he says, Simon, Simon was a Pharisee that invited Jesus. You know, there were two, two uh, debtors that owed a creditor. One owed a thousand, one owed a million. When they both could not pay, he frankly forgave them both. Who would love him more? Mm -hmm. He spoke his language, you know, that Pharisee had dollar signs in his eyes. Oh, sure. He spoke his language, so he says, I suppose the one who is forgiven more. You see this woman? In essence, he's saying, I came to your house. You didn't love me much. Yeah. You didn't give me the basic courtesy even. You know why? You think you're forgiven little. You see this woman? You know why she loved me much? She knows she's forgiven much. Yeah. So Jesus, Jesus believed and taught, all right, that those who know they are forgiven much will love him much. Yeah. So if people know that they are forgiven of their sins, past, present, and future, it will make them licentious. It will yeah. make them fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with Jesus, you fall, in, fall out of love with sin. <laughs> yeah. Talk about this. I heard you mention this recently. You talked about what happened in the life of Peter from the time he met Jesus to those last moments of Jesus on the earth and how he responded to him yeah. differently. Yeah, one of the first times, you know, I, it really uh, uh, blew my mind when I saw this, you know, and I saw this when one of my trips in Israel, uh, I was with my, 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 my pastors and I was just sharing with them how I saw this. Uh, it was amazing because we teach that grace, you know, Pastor Prince, grace is wonderful, amen. You know, grace is basic, it's for the new believers. But we're gonna go into holiness as if holiness is university. Grace is kindergarten, right. you know? But when, when Peter met Jesus, one of the first times he met Jesus, Jesus says, launch out into the deep. And you know the story, he, he got a net breaking, boat sinking load of fishes. He didn't knew the man that was in the boat. He was 
odd, he fell on his knees and turned to Jesus and says, depart from me, mm. I'm a sinful man. Which I'm is, a which is a strange sinful man. response. I mean, yes. this man just filled your boat full right. of fish. So in other words, uh, a sinner or one of the first encounters of Jesus, all right, the basic, the kindergarten response for anyone, for that matter, is always the aspect of his love? No, yeah. his holiness. Yeah, sure. Now, the Lord is holy, tries holy, but he wants us to know him in the aspect of his love. All right, now watch this. Three and a half years passed, okay? And Peter denied knowing Jesus, all right, on the night of the passion that Jesus went through the sufferings and all that. He, he, with cursing and swearing, he denied knowing Jesus, okay? Now, the Bible tells us in, in Luke that the disciples said when Jesus rose from the dead, the Lord has appeared to Simon. Now, that interview, that personal private moment which Jesus had with Peter is not recorded for us in the Gospels. It's veiled from us. Mm. The Holy Spirit didn't seem fit, see, see fit to unveil to us that private moment. Wow. But the Lord appeared to Simon when he rose from the dead. All right? Now, obviously Jesus forgave him. Now, watch this. Two weeks after that, after he rose from the dead, they were by the shores of Galilee. They were fishing again. And the Lord says, children, have you caught any food? They say, no. Throw your net on the right side. The right side is always a place of righteousness, yeah. you know, my right hand of righteousness. And they caught so much fish, okay? Then John recognized, it's the Lord. And Peter jumped into the water to go to Jesus. Yeah. Now, which aspect of the Lord now that he saw? His love. His love. If not, he'll be jumping the other side yeah. of the boat, yeah. you know? So maturity is, as you grow in the Lord, the more of His love you see. What's the basic response of a sinner if an angel appears? It's throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. Get away. Get away from me. Yeah. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. You don't have to teach a sinner God's holiness, but you have to teach people yeah. the love of God. Yeah. No sinner will say, Oh Lord, thy loving kindness is better than life. No sinner will say that. They will, they'll be frightened, yeah. you know? So we, we, do I have to teach holiness? Yes. But let's not have this idea that holiness is deep. Grace is basic. Yeah. It's the other way around. The love of God. We'll never know at whole eternity to learn the length, the depth, the breadth, the height of the love of Christ. And we will drive ourselves into the ground. We will literally kill ourselves trying to be holy apart from a revelation of how much He's loved us, being strengthened by the grace Amen. to do what He's called us to do. Um, there's some things we've got to get into in these broadcasts. I know we're, we're, we're getting so close. Um, as we go on tomorrow, I, I really want to take that next, that next step into this, um, something that you and I've been talking about even privately here, and that is uh, we know who our Father is, but do you know who your mother is? We have been sitting at this table with Pastor Joseph Prince all the way from Singapore. Sir, thank you so much thank once you. again for being on these broadcasts. This is a longtime friend and partner of this ministry, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I know my grandparents were in your country yes, 2005, 2005, I think, yeah. and uh, you were a strong support to them in that meeting, and I know they've never forgotten. I enjoyed having them. And uh, of course, they love you, and they love your ministry, and this, this unrelenting desire that you have that people see Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I, I can tell you too, sir, personally, that when, when I sit and I listen to your ministry, uh, I quit looking at you. I hope you're okay with that, but I just yeah. look at Jesus. Amen. I just Amen. see Him and I'm thankful that's been a blessing. That's what I desire above everything else, that people see Jesus, fall in love with Him. Absolutely. It's not about Joseph Pien or Jeremy Pearson. You know, it's not about, it's about, about us, it's about Him. Yes, it is. Yeah. That must be why my, my son says he doesn't want to be a preacher like Daddy. I, you've heard me tell this on this broadcast before, but I asked my son, who's now three, and he was two at the time, I said, Justice, you want to be a preacher like Daddy? And he said, no, Joseph Pence. <laughs> and uh, I guess he was having a hard time with his R's at that point, yeah. but he, he knows you, and even as a two-year-old, just mm. we have it on in the house. He's just oh, soaking precious. it in. And uh, your, your little one is not too young to be around the Word of God, to be around the anointed Word. Uh, Jesus began growing in the grace on His life mm -hmm. from the very beginning, yeah. and our little ones should be doing the same thing. That's right. We closed yesterday's broadcast by talking about something that I know you're met with a lot when people... I don't think it's by anybody that's actually heard you preach. Yep. I think it's by people who have heard from others uh, mm -hmm. something that you've said or, or something they thought you said. And I know that's something uh, 
my grandfather, even 40, almost 47, well, over 47 years ago now, started preaching mm -hmm. so strong on faith in God and faith in Jesus, faith in the Word. And uh, people almost immediately started talking. Yeah. It was, well... Hyper faith. You know, oh, yeah, and then saying all this stuff. But you know what it did? Yep. <laughs> is it made people run out there and get yeah, these tapes? What amen. is it I'm not supposed to be listening to? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of funny because that's mm -hmm. what the law will do to somebody. That's right. yeah. uh, you tell a little kid, don't go on the street, don't go on the street, yeah, don't go on the yeah, street. Yeah. Well, what do they want to do? They want to go on the that's street. Right. Yeah. But the same thing has happened, I believe, to you in mm -hmm. some cases in your ministry where um, people have heard something that they thought you said. Well, they say, well, he's... He's just preaching a message that, you know, mm -hmm. anybody can go out there and sin. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I've heard you say this too. Why don't you go ahead on this broadcast and just tell us where you stand on sin, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, I, Joseph Prince, and I'll <laughs> rattle off my serial number, you <laughs> yeah. know, my national ID in <laughs> Singapore. And I'll say that I'm categoric, categorically against, vehemently against sin. Yeah. Okay. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than you want to pay. Mm -hmm. All right, sin destroys. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. All right, I am for holiness. Mm -hmm. I think where I differ from some people is this, how to get there from here. Yeah. All right, they say it's by your efforts, all right? You do it hard enough, strong enough, disciplined enough. I say it's by grace, Yeah. okay? But grace has become a cliche. I had a, I had a, a precious man of God in my country that uh, uh, asked me out one time for tea and he wanted to know how our church grew so fast, you know, in, in such a short time. Mm -hmm. So I told him, it's the grace of God, you know. And he looked at me and says, yeah, it's the grace of God. What are you doing? Right, right. You know, he wants, he wants the formula, but the grace of God is no longer an answer for many people. Yeah. It's a cliche right. that you put at the front of a sentence or the end of a sentence. But you really mean it. Yeah, to me, <laughs> it's, really it's my whole it. life. Yeah. It's my whole life. And I think that Jesus... Uh, grace is spelled J-E-S-U-S. -S. It's yeah. Jesus. You know, the law was given by Moses, a servant, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Notice truth is there on the side of grace, but the law is true, but there's, it's not law and truth. Mm -hmm. It's the law was given by Moses. And who is Moses? A servant. Who is Jesus? The son. son. And, and, and we, we esteem the servant greater than the son. Yeah. So that, that, that is the thing. But uh, when it comes to holiness, we, we, we touched on this uh, last night, uh, yesterday, uh, how when Peter first knew Jesus, he knew him in the aspect of his holiness. Mm -hmm. And rightly so, Jesus is holy sure. and, and, and he's thrice holy. But his holiness is such that it's holiness without fanaticism. Okay, it's conviction without intolerance. Or he could move among the, the, the sinners. They could touch him and they could receive. Yeah. All right? It wasn't this holier than thou. But the one aspect that the Lord wants us to know Him more than anything else is His love. Yeah. And that will take an eternity for us to know. Because when, when Peter, all right, in, in, in the two weeks after his, his resurrection, Peter was fishing with uh, John and all the rest. And, and Peter knew Jesus in his love now because he's been forgiven of yeah. denying Jesus with cursing and swearing. So we touch on that. And, and I want to go to further in Galatians chapter 4 mm -hmm. today. Uh, we look at Israel now. Uh, when Israel was a child, look at verse, verse 1 of chapter 4, Galatians. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child. Now in the Greek, child here is the word napios. The word son is huios. Huios is full sonship, mature sonship, where you inherit everything. But as long as as he is a child, a nepios, an infant. He does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Okay, though he's master of all, but he does not differ from a slave. Imagine you have a, a domestic helper at home who is a friend, mm -hmm. okay? But a friend is not your heir. Justice is. Yeah. But justice cannot, cannot fly your plane. He yeah. cannot drive your car. He cannot, uh, you have a, a, a beautiful car, you know, it's Horsepower, I mean, Lamborghini or whatever, <laughs> but he cannot, he cannot, he cannot drive it. I don't have that. He's he doesn't have it. He's, I'm just prophesying here. Yeah, that, I right? receive it. That's and, fine. And, but, and the thing is this, but but justice cannot do that, yeah. right? Because justice is still an infant. Yeah. But is he the heir of it? Yes. Yeah. So when Israel was an heir, the Bible says, all right, God put him under guardians, verse two, guardians, guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Wow. So guardians and stewards is the law and the prophets because the entire book of Galatians is talking about law and grace. So when Israel was a nepios, God put Israel under law. Okay, the Ten Commandments. 
All right? Now, even so, when we were children, when he, he mentioned we here, here in particular in this passage here, he's talking about the Jews. He's identifying with the, his Jewish hearers. All right? When we were children, when we were nepios, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The word elements here is stoikion, which is the ABCs, Greek word for ABCs, elementary, all right, kindergarten. Okay. We were under the elements. The law is elementary, wow. okay? But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Wow. Now, the word adoption is not there. Literally, it is placement as sons. And the word sons here is not, no longer nepios, but huios, full, mature sonship. Jesus brought full, mature sonship. The moment you are born again, you are full, mature son in terms of your position in Christ. Yeah. Okay? And that's why we can cry, all right, Abba, Father, which is daddy, yeah. literally daddy. And, and the thing is this, it's interesting when people say that grace, grace is wonderful, grace is basic, you know, we need to know grace. Young converts, you know, need to know grace. But let's go into holiness, you know, as if holiness is a deeper stuff. But actually, the thing is this, when Israel was under, when Israel was an infant, a baby, God gave them the law for 1,500 years because God wanted them to know, all right, by the law, no one, no one can be made righteous. By the law is the knowledge of sin, not, not righteousness. When the fullness of time came, God sent His Son and brought grace. So which one is mature? All right? Grace gave us maturity. Huyos. Law made Israel mm -hmm. an infant. You know, when, when Jessica was young, her friends would come over to my house, okay? And um, um, I would tell them, don't go to the kitchen. Don't play in the kitchen, all right? Don't touch the gas stove. Yeah. Don't play with the kitchen knives. All, all sorts of laws, okay? Yeah. Now, if you come to my house, Okay, and I say to you, Jeremy, don't touch the kitchen, kitchen knives, all right? Don't, don't, don't play with the gas stove, you know? I'll be insulting you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So, which is maturity? When Israel was an infant, God put them under law. We have it backwards. Yeah. Wow. We have to identify. We know who our Father is. Amen. One of the things that I believe has been so strong and, and a, rev, a, rev, a, rev, excuse me, a revelation the way it comes through you is identifying who your mother is. And I know that sounds strange when you're just sitting there listening to that and like, I know who my mom is, but <laughs> scripturally, where, on which side of this? Walk us through that because it'll make much more sense coming out of yeah. you than it does even out of me. It's from the same chapter, yeah. Galatians chapter 4. Let's go to verse right now. We're in Galatians 4. Let's drop down right now to verse 21. Tell me, the Apostle Paul says, tell me you who desire to be under the law. Or he's talking to people who desire to be under the law. You who desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? Now, before I go to this, I must tell you this, all right? This is, this is a, a powerful revelation that God just shook me with it, you know? If you look at uh, verse 9, it mentions the law, the stoikion, the ABCs, as weak and baggerly mm -hmm. in verse 9. The weak and baggerly elements or ABCs. He calls it weak and baggerly. Do you know that word weak in the Greek is the same word for heal the sick. Mm. Jesus healed the sick. That's the word for weak. Wow. The word baggerly here is the same Greek word as there was a beggar named Bartimaeus. It means poverty. So what would the law do? It brings you to a place of sickness, all right, and poverty. Nothing wrong with the law. Yeah. All right, will keep you a slave. Yeah. Nothing wrong with the law. The law is holy, but it cannot make you holy. The law is just, but it cannot justify you. I thought I'd just put that in. Yeah. Okay, but look at uh, uh, what we talked about just now. Tell me who desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? It is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a born woman, which is Hagar. Hagar was from Egypt. All right, the, the other by a free woman. And we know that's Sarah, Abraham's wife. But he who was of the born woman of Hagar, which is Ishmael, he was born according to the flesh. Notice how God defines the flesh, self-effort. So Hagar, uh, uh, excuse me, Ishmael was born of Hagar when Abraham still had strength. Yeah. Okay? And he of the free woman, true promise, which means by the Spirit, all right? Abraham could not perform anymore, if I can put that way. He cannot have the strength and God came in. Yeah. And Isaac was born. So watch this, which things are symbolic. These two women, they are symbolic. All right? 
I didn't say it, the Bible says it. For these are the two covenants, the old and the new. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. The Ten Commandments is from Mount Sinai. The laws are from Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is Hagar, that slave girl. And it produces what? Bondage. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is a bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, who is the mother of us all. Mm. That's Sarah. Okay? So, which are you? All right? Which the viewers that are watching, I, I like to ask the question, are you my brother or are you a brother from another mother? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So the thing is this, we have the same, just like Ishmael and Isaac, they have the same heavenly father. Well, it's the same father, Abraham. Yeah. So, we have the same heavenly father. Okay? But they have different mamas. Okay? Uh, Ishmael's mother is Hagar, which is the law from Mount Sinai, which produces bondage. Mm -hmm. Isaac's mother is Sarah, which is grace. So, the Bible tells us, it goes on to say, verse 28, let's drop down to verse 28, but we brethren, as Isaac was our children of promise, but as he who was born according to the flesh, which is Ishmael, then persecuted him that was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Mm -hmm. The child of law persecutes the child of grace. It's never the child of grace persecutes the child of law. Yeah. And what is God's verdict? What is God's diagnosis and God's recommendation? Verse 30, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the born woman. Who is the born woman? The law from Mount Sinai. Cast out the born woman and her son, for the son of the born woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. It's a very serious question here on inheritance, the heir. Who will be the heir? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, brethren, we are not children of the born woman, but of the free. So the, the thing is this. Today, uh, some of our biggest problems are coming from people or, or people who challenged, you know, uh, who, who tried to assassinate your character and all that. It comes from people, persecution in other words, come from people who share the same heavenly father mm -hmm. as us, but not the same mother. They will fight for the law. Our mother is grace. Yeah. Okay, and just as it was in times past, all right, the devil is trying to always take grace away from faith. Abraham represents faith. Yeah. Twice the devil tried to take Sarah away from Abraham. One through Pharaoh, another time through Abimelech. It is always the devil attempting to take grace, Sarah, away from faith. Because he knows that when they are together, yeah. It's going to be explosive. And when, you mentioned this to me before, when did uh, Ishmael begin to persecute? Yes. Let's turn to that real quick. And, and, and uh, Genesis 21, if you look at Genesis 21 in the Scriptures, it tells us when this happened. When did Ishmael persecute his half-brother, Isaac? All right? Genesis 21, uh, it tells us very clearly here um, in verse 8, the child grew, Isaac, and was weaned. He was weaned. Remember we said that he that is, he, the, he who defines righteousness as an act, a behavior, mm -hmm. is unskillful. He that is unskillful in the word of righteousness is a babe. In other words, he does not know the word righteousness. It means gift, not an action. Yeah. That person is a babe. But obviously the body of Christ right now is being weaned. They are now understanding righteousness. Yeah. And guess what's happening at the same time? Persecution. Persecution. When did Ishmael persecute Isaac? when Isaac was weaned from milk. Yeah. So the body of Christ now is being weaned from milk. They understand righteousness. So the persecution is starting. And that's also the time that God says, cast out the bond woman. And God spoke through Sarah's mouth. Jeremy, Sarah's mouth. Yeah, I hear it, I hear it. <laughs> Believe me, I hear it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the, the Lord. I, I know that this is setting you free as you're listening to this right now. And there's so much going on, I think, Probably what's happening inside is your, your brain is going, wait a second, wait a second. You got to get out of that and let your heart grab a hold of what you're hearing right now because it's truth and truth. Knowing this truth, isn't that what Jesus yes, said? Yes. What would happen to it? What it would happen you to free. you? Yeah. You'd be made free. Hmm. And that's what's happening, I believe, in the yes. hearts and the minds and the lives of people that have Praise the Lord, they're born again. They're born again. They're in church and they've they say, got... They have the same heavenly father. Absolutely. Just not the same mother. You see, the, the, in essence, they're saying, uh, what they're saying, Sarah can't do a good job in raising Isaac. Sarah, Grace cannot do a good job. Let's bring Hagar back. Wow. Let's bring the law back. No, Sarah is well able to raise her Isaac. So, you know, I'm not sitting and looking at the law every day. 
You know, I'm not yeah. reading it going, yeah. oh, I got to try to keep That's that. Right. But there is, there's a, a, I don't know if this is the way to say it, but a, the, the spirit of that yes. at work. What, how would you describe that? Because some, no, nobody's sitting there going, I got to uh, yes. keep these That's 10 right. or those 600. You're right. And, and, and people are not conscious they're under the law. One of the best ways to say it is like this. Uh, I, I, I think this really helped me ask the Lord how, how to define this so that people can put it, you know, into, into practice on a, in a practical way on a daily basis. And he said this, just remember, my law is all about demand. Mm -hmm. My grace is all about supply. The law demands righteousness. Grace supplies righteousness as a Glory gift. To God. The law says you shall not. Grace says I will. Yeah. All right. So it's always demand. So if I wake up in the morning and I have so many things to do and I'm demand oriented, Oh, you know, my wife demands this of me. My boss demands this of me. You know, my congregation demands this of me. You are demand-minded. You'll be under stress. And mm -hmm. practically, even you understand law and grace, you are actually under law. Wow. But if you wake up and you say, wow, I got a big project ahead of me and I got to finish this. I got this meeting to do. I got that, you know, preaching assignment. I've got uh, this thing. But if you are supply-minded, God will supply everything. Yeah. And then God will supply it. So when, okay, I'll just flow into it. Then you are under grace in a practical way. So what we've got to do in our lives is set up indicators, right? gauges. Yes. The same way you would in a car. If you want to know what condition your car Excellent. is in, you look at the gauge, yes. right? Well, you, you like want to that. know what condition you're in. Where's the, where's the rest That's right. level? Very where's good. the joy yeah. level? Because right. when there's an absence, this is what I'm hearing you say, and you yes. tell me if I'm right. Yes. But when there's an absence of rest, right. then I'm looking to myself mm. and I'm depending on me to get me from here you are demand-minded and you're under stress. Yeah. You're looking to yourself. But if you look at someone, even though he's busy, look at Jesus. There's never, I, I've never seen anyone as busy as Jesus, and yet he's never so restful. Yeah. Right, as you see him in the, in the Gospels, in the midst of the multitude. He yeah. always has time. He always has time. Yeah. There's the rhythm of grace to everything he did. The unforced rhythm of grace. grace. Yeah. And you can tell, you can tell when people hear this, uh, that there's, there's a lot of undoing yeah. that has to be done. You can tell the Apostle Paul had a hard time mm -mm. trying to get it out. You know, that's why mm -mm. I think that's why he had to say so many times, yet not I. Yeah, yeah. Like, How do I explain this to you? I'm, I'm crucified, but I'm not. But yeah, I am, yeah, but I'm yeah, not. Yeah. You know, he had mm. to say it, yet not I. That's got to become the description of our lives. Mm. I'm alive, yet it's not me, it's Jesus in yes. me. And that's what he said too. He said the same thing when he said, I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. If but he the, left it there, the grace, yes, this right. message yeah. is ruined. But he said, I'm working hard, harder than anybody, but yet I'm not. Yet I am, but I'm not. Well, if it's not you, Paul, who is it? It's the grace. The grace of God. Which is to say it's Jesus. And what is so cool is this, Jeremy. You know, when, when he says, when, 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 when Paul says, yet not I, but the grace of God that causes me to labor more abundantly, Think about how cool this is. The Lord gives you the grace to be a Bible teacher. Mm. The Lord gives you the grace to be a shepherd. All right? God gives you the grace to do whatever you need to do. God gives you the grace to do it. And when you do it, when you execute the grace that He gives you, He rewards you for, for doing the grace yeah. that He first gave you. That He did. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that? It's great. You know? No wonder it's worthy is the Lamb. We, we receive the crowns. Yeah. We know where to place it, yeah. you know, because it's, it's all Him. It is. Yeah. I want that to resound as we close this broadcast today. Identify in your life, and you can do it in a hurry. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit in you will help you. Jesus, what have I been doing under my own strength that I need to turn over to you right now? And when you do it, the, the, he, he is your caretaker. He'll take it and you can be free of it. What we're doing is changing the way we think about some things. Number one, changing the way we think about God. Mm -hmm. This might be brand new information to you, but God is not mad at you. Mm -hmm. He's not angry with you. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done, but He does, and He's still not angry with you. That's how good He is, mm -hmm. and that's how much He loves you. And it's you believing that that will produce the power to change in your life. And, and, and nobody would argue with this, sir. I mean, that mm -hmm. 
God, there's a way to live that is pleasing to Him and yes. brings glory to Him, and it's mm -hmm. different than the rest of this world. Yes. It's a high way of living, but what we've got to address and what we've been addressing mm -hmm. is how do we get there? How do we get there? How do we That's get right. from A to B? And that, to me, mm -hmm. the way I've heard this, I'm like you, I'm hesitant to call it the grace message. The, the, right. the way I've heard the gospel mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that I have these last few years, mm -hmm. that's what I hear when I hear that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that there's nothing to do, it's that number one, Jesus has done it, mm -hmm. and that not that I do nothing, but that I do only. Right. right. What I hear, what I mm -hmm. see my Father do, just like Him. Right. And mm -hmm. then, even then, I depend on God working in me yes. to will and, and to, to do, do it. Yeah. And that's what these broadcasts have been mm -hmm. about. And if I could be so bold, that's what your ministry is about. And that's why so many people all over the world are being blessed mm -hmm. and finding the strength to change people who've been bound up in addictions, mm -hmm. bound up by fear, a bondage of any kind. They're finding their freedom. They're finding that they can reign in this life. Mm -hmm. And when they do those things, don't. And it's so simple. Yes. People want to know, well, wh what do you do to get free? Right. Jesus. Jesus said all. to people, <laughs> when they said, we want to work the works of God. He said, your work yeah. is to believe. believe. Yeah. You know, there's something in man that's like, yeah, yeah okay, I get that, but what else? Right. Yeah. There's something in man that wants to say, right. look what I did. That's right. I earned it. I made it. Me, yeah. man, me make living for yeah. family. You know, it's... And that's natural. That's natural. You know, um, grace... It's not supernatural. It's, yeah, it's not supernatural. It is logic, logical, yeah. all right? But grace is not logical. All right, if you tell me, do good, get good, do bad, get bad, that's logical. Makes sense. Every religion teaches that. That's the essence of the law. But if you tell me I can receive good I don't deserve mm -hmm. because another received all the bad that he didn't deserve, that takes the Holy Spirit. That takes the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit to understand. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. That takes believing how much you're loved. How much you're loved, yeah. yeah. Get and us back into this today. Where do, where do we go from, from where we've been as we keep layering on this. I think my heart, my heart goes out to pastors and leaders. I think they are all for the same thing. They want, they want a vibrant, growing, healthy congregation, people who are full of the spirit and mm -hmm. not just uh, uh, people who are, you know, uh, moving in the gifts, but also in the fruit of the spirit, you know what I'm saying? And we touched that on the, on the first uh, broadcast uh, this week. Uh, we touched on how the fruit of the spirit comes about. It's a fruit. It is not something you do, it's a fruit. Mm -hmm. And we have taught it like it's a discipline. Yeah. You've got to discipline yourself to have all this, you know. But when you're under grace, that's the fruit. So we've got to focus on grace because grace not only saves, Jeremy, grace also teaches. Yes. Grace also teaches. Grace in Titus 2, it says Titus, the grace yeah. of God teaches us. There you go, Pastor Prince. You've got, you got to teach on denying ungodliness. And wait a minute, it doesn't say you teach. It says the grace of God yeah. will teach. Grace of God teaches us. We teach grace to our people. The grace of God will teach them wow. from within. Isn't that what he said too when he said, I will write my laws on exactly. the heart. Exactly. I, you won't have need yes. of somebody standing there telling you. Exactly. And, and, and no one need to teach each other, know the Lord. All shall know me from yeah. the least to the greatest. That's, that's a clause of the new covenant. And what makes, what makes all that work? What makes all the clause of the new covenant work? The last phrase, because I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins are remembered no more. Wow. And I still hear preaching on Deuteronomy where it says, I'll visit your iniquity to the third and fourth generation. Wait a minute. Which covenant are we preaching now from? Yeah. We are still preaching from Mount Sinai. All right. New covenant, God says, I will remember your sins no more. I will remember your sins no more means what? There was a time I remembered your yeah. sins, but no more. Yeah. Why? I remembered them all at the cross. And I, 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 I punished my son, all right, for all your sins. So today, because I am holy, people think that, that grace is because, or, you know, there is therefore now no condemnation or you're just making God appear like he's soft on sin. No, there is therefore now no condemnation because God is holy. Yeah. Because he is holy, because he is just, he cannot punish the same sin twice. Yeah once in the body of my surety, and then in my body, in my life. They'll make him unjust. Yeah. Okay, so it's because God is holy, there is no imputation of sin in my life. He'd because, be unjust to you and to yes, Jesus. Yes, to Jesus. And he's not about to do that. And he's not about to do that. Now, I've, I've heard uh, 
well-meaning, great men of God, wonderful, precious people, who, you know, and they tend, they, 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 they tend to repeat something they've heard, like, for example, if God does not judge America, God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know? And, and I understand where they're coming from, but I say if God judges America, He'll have to apologize to Jesus, hmm. okay? Because even Sodom and Gomorrah, when, when Abraham interceded, he says, if you find 10 righteous, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? If you find 10, God says, for 10, I will not destroy. You mean to tell me you cannot even find 10 righteous men by the gift of righteousness through the blood of Jesus in America today? So I, I, I think that we got to change the way we preach. We got to preach from Mount Zion, not from Mount Sinai. Yeah. From the new covenant, not from the old covenant. Yeah. It's time for us to preach. You know, for example, the Bible says in Colossians, you are complete in Christ. Okay, you are complete in Christ. And there's a starting post of the believer. What do we do? We take the starting post, make it a finishing post. One of these days, you'll be complete in Christ. Hmm. But no, you've got, got to realize that you are complete in Christ, you are seated with Christ, now walk out from that sense of completeness. Brother Copeland likes to say this, I'm not trying to be healed. Yeah. I am the healed. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It is so restful when you realize, I'm not trying to get it, I have it. I'm complete in Christ. Yeah. Let's deal with some of these things that I know you hear quite a bit and, and anybody would really. I think you call them the whatabouts. Yes, the whatabouts. Uh, somebody hears a message on the power of the grace of God and, and what they're responding to is yep. the, the too goodness of this. It's too yeah. good to be That's true. Right. It's, yeah. But really it's so good that it is true. Um, what are some of these that you've heard and that you, yes. that you want to address? Fact, uh, on these I, have, I have a, a, a whole series of teachings. It's called What About, literally, mm -hmm. yeah. What About. What about what about? <laughs> and and we have what about Ananias and Sapphira? Mm -hmm. What about repentance? What about Hebrews chapter six? You know, the falling away. What about he Hebrews ten? So it's all covered. It's not possible for me to cover everything here. Sure. But if you want to, you know, that, that series covers everything. But one of the things I like to cover is uh, what about repentance? Mm -hmm. You know, people have ideas about you know if you're you're preaching grace, not preaching repentance. Well, number one, uh, how do you define repentance? In the Greek, it says metanoia which is change of mind, okay? So every Sunday, all right, in my church, as I'm preaching the beauty and the lovely and the glory, the loveliness and the glories of Jesus, all right, repentance is going on all the time. Of how good God is, repentance is going on all the time, mm -hmm. you know? And repentance is not this smiting your breast, saying, Jesus, Jesus, because you can cry your eyeballs out and still go away the same, all right? Repentance is hearing something that causes you to change your mind. The Apostle Paul in Acts 20, verse 21, he says, repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. The first area repentance must happen is towards God. Change your mind towards God. You used to think that He was against you. Yeah. Now change your mind. He is for you. Yeah. You used to think that God wants you to perform. No, He wants you to rest and let Him perform in you, through you, for you. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind change. And, and that mind change is going on like in Brother Copeland's ministry. You know, every time he teaches, people are repenting all the time without using the word repentance. Yeah. Now you can use the word repentance if you want, but it's nothing more than change your mind. By the way, the other kind of, you know, crying Jesus, the smiting your breast kind of thing, and feeling remorseful. Some people think that you must cry enough and then, uh, uh, you know, feel remorseful. Don't forget in Matthew 29, I believe, or Matthew 27, it says that, that uh, uh, Judas, after he realized that Jesus did not defend himself, he realized that they're going to crucify Jesus, he felt remorseful. Now in the old King James, it says he repented himself. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver. That word repented is there. The word remorseful is there mm. in the new King James. So remorseful doesn't mean, but he committed the ultimate act of self-righteousness. He hung himself. Wow. He punished himself. If he had only waited a few hours more, Jesus would have become his substitute yeah. on the cross. And Peter did wait for a while yeah. and received the forgiveness, you know. And, and I think that uh, uh, this what about is, is, is very important because we need to uh, always remember when you meet an obscure passage that seems to contradict the grace of God, just remember you cannot use obscure passage to interpret obscure passage. Yeah. You need to interpret obscure passage with certain clear passage. Yeah. And one of them I'd like to go into right now is Isaiah 54, sure. all right, about uh, 
uh, God swearing something very powerful to us in Isaiah 54 here. Here we, now Isaiah 54 comes after Isaiah 53. <laughs> Makes sense. All right. Isaiah 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By His stripes we are healed. We know Isaiah 53 as the famous chapter on the sufferings of the Messiah, the, the Savior. But look at Isaiah 54 that comes right after, after the sufferings of Jesus, the results that ensued from His sufferings. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 54, look at verse 9. God is talking, For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. Now the word rebuke here is the word condemn. Yeah. It is used like the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, in Zechariah. It's a strong word. God promises, Jer Jeremy. God has lifted His hand. And God does not have to swear. His word mm -hmm. alone is enough. You and I, we have to swear, you know. But God lifts His hand and, and God... Sw swore here, yeah. all right? He swore, I'll never be angry with you, nor condemn you. Wow. Is that clear? Or is it an obscure passage? It's clear, clear, clear as crystal. Clear. And not only that, this is like the waters of Noah, God says. So when I see a rainbow now, I don't think of God not flooding the earth again. I think of Isaiah 54, all right? That God will never be angry with me again. Praise the Lord. And that's why there's a rainbow around the throne in Revelation. All right, which means when you come to the throne of grace, always see a smiling God, yeah. a God who approves and accepts you, all right, who loves you, and He has sworn He will never be angry with you. Yeah. All right. Now, the, what is interesting is this: if you look at uh, Jesus and what makes Him angry, we assume He's angry at the money changers, but you, f you don't find the the scripture saying He was angry. That statement is not there. We assume he was angry, and, and for all you know, he was angry, but it's not stated in the scriptures that he was angry. It just says he drove them out. Yeah. But in one place, it says Jesus, there was a, a man who was impotent, all right? Uh, he, his, his hand was withered, yeah. and, the, and the ruler of the synagogue was, and the Pharisees were there, and they were watching to see whether Jesus would heal. Yeah. Think of how hard their heart is. Yeah. They knew he could heal. They were watching to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. And the Bible says, and Jesus being angry. That's the first time in the Gospels you ever find, the only place you find the Holy Spirit stating Jesus was angry. Mm. Not only that, and Jesus being angry, comma, being grieved at the hardness, hardness of yeah. their hearts. Yeah. Okay? So, in just this passage alone, you find Jesus being angry, being grieved. All right? At what? The lack of grace. Yeah. Not because they were they were they were smoking pot. Not because they were sleeping around. These yeah. people were were, were 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 defenders of the law. They were trying to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Yeah. All right. And Jesus was angry at that. He was grief at that. So what makes Jesus angry today? You know, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When there's a lack of grace. By the way, that word being grief at the hardness. The word grief there is the same Greek word, the same root word as the word grief, not the Holy Spirit of God. Mm. All right. But if you look at Ephesians where it says, and grief not the Holy Spirit. It starts with a conjunction, and. You don't start a statement with and, all right? So you must look at the preceding verse. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, watch this, the may minister, grace, grace to the hearers. Yeah. Whatever, it's not talking about profanities or, you know, I'm against profanity and vulgarities, but it's not talking about that. Whenever you speak words of grace, guess what? You please the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Whenever you speak words of legalism and law, if you speak words that's, you know, implied like your children, for example, daddy's going to love you if you behave. That's not grace. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. The whole context there is the Holy Spirit is, is grief when your words do not minister grace. Wow. And that's the only place that it says the Holy Spirit is grief. Now today we have people taking that verse out of context saying that, well, her makeup just grieves yeah, right. me, you know. And uh, when she stepped into the fellowship, I just felt grief, you know. No, you're a jealous woman. <laughs> you're just plain jealous because she's better looking than you, you know what I'm saying. So. <laughs> wow. Uh, what, what would you say to somebody who, in light of all this or listening to this, would say, well, you know, it's too late for me because I have fallen from grace, okay, something let's, we've used a lot, an expression yes, we you're right. throw around. But mm -hmm. I don't think we know 
really what it means. Very good, uh, Jeremy. Let's turn to uh, Galatians. I, I, you know, we got to refer, I got so much to share, but we need to look at the Bible because uh, Bible must interpret Bible. Even uh, terms that we use so freely, we say things like fallen from grace. You know, that, that pastor ran off with the secretary. He fell from grace. You know, that guy embezzled money. You know, he fell from grace. Now, these are wrong. These things are sin, all right? But, but fallen from grace has been so abused. That phrase appears only, only once. Actually, I would say twice because in Hebrews 12, it talks about the two mountains. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. You know, about the shaking. But let's look at this. What, what is fallen from grace? Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 6, it says, for in Christ, excuse me, verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. Now, I'm reading from the New King James. If you look at the Old King James, it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> if, you, if you are sick, you don't want Christ to become of no effect. Right. If you, 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 you are poor and broke, you don't want Christ to become of no effect. If you are depressed, you don't want Christ to become of no effect. Okay? And it says here, Christ is become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Mm. In other words, when you attempt to be justified by the law, Christ becomes of no effect because you don't need Him anymore. Mm. You're, you're, you're trying out your own strength, all right? And not only that, you're fallen from grace. Okay, so falling from grace is not falling into sin. In fact, those who fall into sin, when they sin, they fall into grace. Now, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You need to take advantage of that grace right now yeah. and get out of your sin, okay? But falling from, fall, uh, fall from grace, is notice fall from, which mm -hmm. means grace is higher it's than higher, the law. Sure. Yeah. For you to go to the law, you must fall from. That's why in the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, you know the covering, all right, that covers the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, it's called the mercy seat. But what's inside? You have the Ten Commandments. When you go back to the Ten Commandments, notice you fall from your high ground. Mm -hmm. You fall from grace. Okay? So falling from, from, fall from grace is actually someone, someone trying their best mm -hmm. with their own effort. All right? Christ becomes of no effect. Notice in, in Jesus' uh, ministry in the Gospels, when Jesus moved among the multitudes and all that, who were those that He had effect on? Sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, all right, social outcasts. As many as touch him, they receive. Who are the ones that cannot receive? Self-righteous. The self-righteous Pharisees. All right? And by the way, Jesus never categorized people. All right? For example, you know, in his healing ministry, he never said, all those of you who need to get right with your spouse, okay? Yeah. All right? You get right right now before I pray for you. You stand over here in a group. All right? Those of you who have, who, you have un unforgiveness in your hearts, okay, you stand over here. Now, I'm against unforgiveness, all right? But I think many a times we, we put a lot of qualification on, 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 on the person uh, about to receive healing to the point that they don't have faith anymore, yeah. you know? And, and we tell them, you stand over here. You, you, if, you, if you feel there's sin in your life, you all stand over here, all right? I'm going to deal with these people first. At the end, there's no one else left. Yeah. He never did that. He never qualified people for, for healing. As many as touch him, they receive. I'm sure that in the bunch of the multitudes, I'm sure there are people who were quarreling that morning. I'm sure that there were people who were not right with their spouse. I'm sure there were people who had bitterness in their hearts. I'm sure there were gossipers among them, but they all received. Yeah. All right? And when they received the goodness of God, it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance it is. many a times. But we tell people, unless you do this, you cannot receive. Yeah. Unless you do this. And I used to preach like that, you know. I used to preach like f three reasons why people are not healed. And then it became five reasons why people are not <laughs> healed. Then later on it becomes seven reasons why they are not healed. And then one day I was preaching like this and God says, stop disqualifying my people. Wow. I said, Lord, I, wasn't, I was well intent. My heart was in the right place. I said, God, I, 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 God says, don't, don't disqualify my people. My blood has qualified them. Wow. So that changed my preaching. You know, I don't say anymore in a, in a hard way, all right? Um, if you're not healed, okay, all right, there's something wrong with you, okay? No, all right? It, it, the, the wrong thing is the wrong believing. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. It's that not is, something yeah. wrong with you in terms of your behavior. It's a wrong believing. Yeah. And that's what Brad Copeland teaches also. It's all about, hey, guys, God is good. Yeah. You know, God loves you and God wants you healed more. And, and, and Mimi, I mean, your grandma would, yes. would say, yeah. God wants you healed more than you want to be healed. Yeah. You know, God, God's will for you to be well. We can just preach that. 
and tell them, but what, what about my sin? What about, I, I did this, you do not know me, you, I did all that. That's why forgiveness of sins must be a settled reality in their lives. We need to preach this more and more. I tell you what, you know, I, I think that many a times, you know, people hear grace one time and they think they got it. Yeah. You know, whereas grace needs, to, you need to hear it again and oh, again and oh. again and again because you can hear grace preach in, in five successive weeks, back to back. On the sixth week, on the sixth week, all right, you hear a mixture. You can forget all ten. Wow. There's something about our flesh, the propensity towards legalism. Yeah. And we've got to hear it and hear it and hear it hear because it, hear it's it. undoing things that need to be undone. And it's, it's building structure in you that will hold up the truth of the Word of God about who you are and who Jesus is in you and who you are in Him. Sir, what an awesome week it has been. Oh, it's been my honor and privilege. I, I, I've I'm enjoyed so thankful. myself very Thank much. you, thank you, thank you. And I want to thank my grandparents, Kenneth and Gloria yes. Copeland, uh, for allowing me this opportunity and getting behind us in support of these broadcasts. I know they've been friends and partners with you and your ministry for a long time, and I know that you have been a strong, strong partner to them. And on behalf of them, they said, give him our love and tell him we're coming. So they are, they are coming to preach at the star just as soon as the Lord would allow them to do it. Okay. Uh, and, and now it's on tape. And yes. everybody in the world has heard it, so you can't, you yes. can't deny it. Um, you know, and he's going he's gonna to be until 120 years old. He'll be around a while. He'll be around. You need to learn how to see you. You need to learn to see you the way God sees you. And when he looks at you, he's not looking at you, he's looking at Jesus. And you and I need to learn to see ourselves as uh, totally justified, Amen. right? the righteousness of God in Christ, deeply loved by him. That's what these broadcasts have been about. Mm -hmm. That's what your ministry is about. And I'm so thankful for it. It's mm -hmm. been a blessing to my life, my, my wife, Sarah, mm -hmm. our marriage, our ministry, her ministry is a psalmist and songwriter. I mean, mm -hmm. you go through mm -hmm. the, the songs the Lord has given her and they have so much to do with living life in the light yeah. of the love and the grace of God. This is the latest album, right? Yeah, living in, in the light, light of, of love grace. and grace. That's it. And it's, That's uh, how we should live our lives. Amen. Amen. I want to get right back into this today where we've been looking at how to get from where we are to where we know God has called us to be, who He's called us to be. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more rest in it than I think we've realized. Yes. And I remember when Jesus said, look at the lilies. Mm -hmm. He said, look how they grow. Mm -hmm. And then He said, they neither toil nor spin. Right. He said, yes. this is how they grow by what they don't do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've been getting into in the yes. Word of God. That's, that's the revelation of Jesus, Him Amen. at work in us. Amen. And I want to finish this strong today. What's on your heart, sir? Take us into this again. I think uh, my, my heart goes out to people who are, who are suffering and, uh, and people who, who, has, uh, who are looking, reaching out for healing, all right? And, and they've been trying to be healed. And I find that it's amazing. I've been in the body of Christ, uh, you know, since I was a teenager, uh, born again. Uh, but really spirit-filled, you know, in my late teen years. But uh, I've been the word of faith, so to speak. We call it the word of faith, you know, um, for, for many years now. But the thing is that some of the people who are struggling to receive healing are people in the word of faith. Yeah, sure. You know, and, but they hear so much about it. They hear so much about it. And, and, and I think that uh, what they need to know is, is to feed on along the lines of the forgiveness and, and the fact that their sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Because many a times Jesus would say to a man, for example, the guy who was lowered from the roof, mm -hmm. all right, son, your sins be forgiven you before he healed him. He, that man needed the assurance that his sins are forgiven. Then he will say, rise, take up your bed and walk. Psalms 103, who forgiveth all our iniquities. The next line says, who heals all our diseases. Notice the all, the two yeah. alls. But unless you know the first all, your sins are forgiven, past, present and future. All your sins are forgiven. Then can you experience all your diseases being healed. So now we have partial healing mm -hmm. because we have belief in a partial forgiveness. Wow. All right, and always the assurance that we must settle in is our sins are forgiven. That puts you in a posture, your, even your physical body goes into rest. Because many a times when your body, when you experience guilt and condemnation, even doctors, uh, um, secular doctors, unbelieving doctors will tell you that, that uh, some, some conditions are caused, by what they call autoimmune disorders, it's caused by your body fighting itself, all right? 
there's an intelligence in our DNA. For example, when we sin, we are guilty, all right? We do not know how to revert that to the cross. I tell people all the time, when you, when you, sin, when you sin, how do you handle it? Confess I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Look at the cross, always look at the cross. There is my punishment. There is my beating. Stop beating yourself. Yeah. Because if you don't, when you start feeling guilty, condemnation kills. When you start feeling guilty, uh, what's gonna happen? Your DNA is so intelligent. That's been proven by science. Your DNA will say, guys, this guy wants to punish himself. Mm. Let's create a disease. Wow. But when you look to the cross and you say, there is my punishment, there is my beating, everything about you, the, your DNA goes, boys, chill out, rest. Stand. We are at peace. Yeah. Stand off. Now, many a times, I think people are sick not because of sin. They are sick because of condemnation. Yeah. And that's why this message is so important. All right, since I preach this message, I have so many testimonies. Many of them are also in the book, Power of Right Believing. We share, and many of them are from America. You know, we share how they got healed. One lady, for example, in my church, I, I taught on uh, 1 John 4, 17, how as he is, present tense, as he is at the Father's right hand, so are we in this world, not when we die and go to heaven. Mm -hmm. All right, as he is, so are we in this world. Is he under God's unclouded favor? So are we. So are we. All right. Is he healthy? Yes. So are we. So are we. All right. Now, people say things like, how can you just confess as he is, so am I, then things happen to your body. All right. No, look at what happened to Peter. When Peter saw Jesus walking on the storm, the stormy waves, as long as his, his eye was on Jesus, something supernatural happened to him. Mm -hmm. He also was as he is. So was Peter above the storm walking on the water. The moment he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the boisterous winds and the waves, he sang, he became natural. Mm -hmm. So likewise, when we say, as he is, so are we in this world, all right, something happens to us, all right? Also in the area of our, our bodies. I have a lady in my church, she went for a mammogram test and the doctors found a lump that they're concerned about in her, her breast. And they said she must come back for further tests. That weekend, I preached on, as he is, so are we in this world. And she showed me her medical report. She says, Pastor Prince, look at this. All right, I wrote down, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Does Jesus have lumps in his breast? <laughs> as he is, so am I, yeah. she said. And guess what? She went back for the, the, the further test and they found nothing. Now, in my book, I share about a lady uh, who wrote, a lady from America who wrote to us. She read that account that I shared in my book, Unmerited Favor. She said that she, she was diagnosed. She went for mammogram, mammogram test. She was diagnosed as having a, a, a lump that caused concern for the doctors. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to run further tests. She read that, 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 that part. She went back to the book and read that part. And she says, Lord Jesus, as you are, so am I in this world. All right. And she wrote down also, does Jesus have lumps in his breast? All right. You are free from lumps. So am I in this world. Went back to the doctors. They found no lumps. The thing is this, it, it may not happen overnight, but always, Keep on looking at Jesus. Mm -hmm. And whatever you need, if you are, you, you are suffering from depression, just say, Lord, are you free from depression? As you are free from depression, mm -hmm. so am I in this world. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, Spirit transforms us as we behold, not as we strive. Mm -hmm. As we behold, He transforms us from glory to glory. Amen. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 3 right now. Sure. I just want to call your attention uh, and, and, and the viewers to verse 9, verse 6, excuse me, who also made us sufficient, God made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, not of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, you see that? The letter kills, mm -hmm. condemnation kills, all right? The spirit gives life. Now, how do I know it's referring to the law? Because the next verse says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, the only part of the law that's engraved on stones, Jeremy, is the Ten Commandments. The other part of the law, all right, the washing of uh, uh, hands and killing of animals, the, the feasts of Israel, are all written on parchments, skin parchments. Okay. The only part of the law that's engraved on stones is the Ten Commandments. Okay. And God calls it the ministry of death. death. And sometimes we are unleashing this ministry as a series, a Sunday series, you know, <laughs> and, and killing people slowly. Notice it says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. When God first gave the law to Israel, the Israelis will tell you this, all right? They celebrate Pentecost for the giving of the law, all right? Passover, their first Passover, Israel came out through the blood of the Lamb. Number 50 days, the first 
the first Pentecost, God gave the law. Okay? So today, Jewish people celebrate Pentecost as the giving of the law. We celebrate Pentecost as the giving of the Spirit. Notice, when God gave the law on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died. Mm -hmm. Okay? You fast forward to the Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, notice the phrase, full, fully. God waited sure. until the day of Pentecost was fully come. God gave what? The law? No. The, the Spirit. Spirit. And 3,000 people were saved. Praise the Lord. Which goes to show the latter kills. All right? You'll become sick. All right? You'll, you'll be introspective, you become sick emotionally, sick physically, but grace gives life. Yes. When God gave the Spirit on Mount Zion this time, 3,000 people were saved. Okay? And by the way, the tongues that they heard were declaring the wonderful works of God. Whereas when the law was given, it is man's works. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. But when God gave the Spirit, it was about the wonderful works of mm. God. So the, here, the attention, the, the attention, the focus changes. It oh, that's comes right. Off that's of right. You and on to him, and this is why he feels so strongly about you and I living under this self righteousness. Right. He calls it yeah. filthy. Yes. In comparison, and we become self occupied. Yeah. You know, we become like instead of looking to Jesus, looking away from self, we are looking within. Have I obeyed enough? Why, why, why am I feeling like this? Yeah. Why are my thoughts like this? We don't realize that the devil wants us self-occupied. Yeah. He, he will tell you, look at your thoughts. In fact, he will throw the thoughts in your mind. All right, He will use the personal pronoun. He won't say you're an addict. You have an eating disorder. You are depressed. He won't say that. He will say, I am depressed. He uh -huh. will throw that thought and you begin to, like Brother Copeland says, why take thought saying? Yeah. All right? You know, Jesus said, that's how you take thought, by saying with your mouth. The moment you say, I, well, I guess I'm an addict. I'm depressed, all right? You accept it, mm -hmm. okay? So you gotta know his, his game. And the, the only way out is to look away from self and to Christ yeah. as he is, so am I. And that is where the battle is. We need more and more preachers and, 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 and teachers that will point people to Jesus, make them Christ occupied, yeah. you know? And then when they are Christ occupied, all right, the Lord will transform them just by beholding Christ. Yeah. All right. Don't worry about, I just want to say to pastors and leaders, don't worry about, about their transformation. When you put Christ in front of them, yeah. all right, the Holy Spirit goes into action. Yeah, that's not our job. That's not our job. We're the Holy the Spirit goes yeah. into action and they are transformed by beholding. Amen. That's what this chapter in 2 Corinthians it ends, goes on to say. Yeah, by exactly. beholding, reflecting, right. we've gone from that glory, yeah. that partial incomplete thing that Moses right. saw that day, right. we've gone from that to this glory, then this, this whole thing here is the comparison between yes. those two. And he talks about the comparison also between ministry of condemnation yeah. and the ministry of righteousness. Okay, in verse 9, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, mind you, God is not saying those past revivals that focus on sin, all right, that cause a lot of sinners to come to the altar, mm -hmm. they were genuine revivals, sure. but they focus on sin. And the Bible says they had glory. Yeah. That ministry had glory. But God says the ministry of righteousness, if that ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. You ain't yeah. seen nothing yet. Yeah. In these last days, God is raising ministers of righteousness and the glory of this ministry will be greater, exceeds much more than that ministry of condemnation. And here we that are. had glory. Here we are on Friday reading about much more, much more. which is where we started on Monday in Romans yeah. chapter 5 with what Jesus did, yes. much more, much greater than what happened through Adam. I, I think that you, you hit it right, you are right on the money there, you know, and this is where I think, uh, you know, I just feel impressed right now to turn to a, a portion, just to share what God is doing around the world. Yeah. You know, if we have time, just turn right now to Jeremiah 23. Sure. And I think that uh, it's good that we end the entire thing uh, on this last broadcast with Jeremiah 23, what God is doing right now around the world. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's a prophecy of our times, Jeremy, mm -hmm. this part here. Number one, he will tell you what God is doing, all right? Number two, the effects. Number three, the message that's been preached and when this will happen. Real quick, look at uh, verse, chapter 23 of Jeremiah, verse, verse three. I'll gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries. Now, this is our times. Israel was in bondage in the Old Testament only in Babylon. They came back only from Babylon, never from all countries. This is our time, mm. okay? Verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them. 
In verse 1, he talks about, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. But look at verse 4. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. And three things will happen. They shall fear no more, nor be discouraged, nor be dismayed or discouraged, nor shall they be lacking, Praise the says Lord. the Lord. So God is raising shepherds like you, Jeremy. All right, shepherds like Brother Copeland. Shepherds that will feed, not beat, number one. Three things will happen, okay? The people will fear no more, nor be discouraged, nor be lacking. Wow. Okay? Now, what is the message that these shepherds would feed them during this time? It goes on to say, because of time, let's drop down to verse 6. The whole, I'm preaching from context here, mm -hmm. all right? In his days, the days of the Messiah, Judah will be safe and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called. Wow. The Lord, our righteousness, oh, Jehovah Sidkenu. So not only he tells you what he's going to do in the end times, our times when Israel comes back right, from all countries, God will raise up shepherds. And I'm seeing that happen all over the world, especially here in America. God is raising a whole new generation. All right. The church is saying, we don't know what to do with the young generation. In fact, from the young generation, God is raising a whole new breed of mm -hmm. preachers that are preaching the Lord, our righteousness. That's the message they are yeah. preaching, grace, all right? And the result is that people will fear no more, nor be discouraged, nor be lacking. We have to leave that verse in its context. The message is the Lord, our righteousness. Yeah. Now, when will this happen? The, verse, the next verse says in verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, in the Old Testament, right? The story of Exodus. Verse 8, But as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country. Now, this is Russia. We are seeing this happen right now. Russian Jews are coming back to mm -hmm. Israel. Okay? So, in other words, we are, when you see this happen, the message of that hour, all right, not only from the north country, from all the countries where I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. We are seeing the Jews come back from Russia and from all the countries back to Israel. This is the time, God says, I'm going to restore that message. I'm going to recover for the church that message, the Lord, our righteousness. Lord, our righteousness. Okay? I'll raise up shepherds. During this time, I'll raise up shepherds that will preach this message, yeah. and the people will fear no more, nor be discouraged, nor be lacking. And it's not that we are our own righteousness. Very good. But that it's Jesus Lord, is our, our righteousness. righteousness. And we talked about this and when these cameras weren't running, but David said that. David looking forward, looking at us, hmm. operating in that office of the prophet said, his righteousness will endure forever. Excellent, yeah. That's the righteous, that, that yeah. is the gift of righteousness. Yes. Enduring everlasting. Amen. Now connect Amen. this to the healing of our bodies, because these two things are not, they're not two different topics. This is yes. not one message and then healing is another. Yeah, in, in, first, in first Peter 2 Peter 2.24, it says, um, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins mm -hmm. should live unto righteousness. righteousness. Now, again, what do you think of when you think of righteousness? Some people think, well, being dead to sins, we live unto right Doing behavior, right, right. right? But that's a gift of righteousness. But it's not true yet. Being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, comma, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, the way it is phrased is not a normal kind of phrasing. It is saying righteousness, living to righteousness is the fulfillment of by whose stripes you are healed. Wow. In other words, when you realize you are righteous, that fulfillment of that, what Christ did by His stripes will happen. Yeah. When you awaken to the fact that you are righteous, you are healed. And that's being healed in your on body. the inside. Yes, and then it manifests on the outside. Yeah. That's right. And, 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 and this is where I think um, uh, people are missing it because they are trying to get healing. They hear about healing and it's all good, but the thing is they're trying to get healing from sin consciousness. Yeah. You can't do that. In fact, what is interesting is that during the times when, before the law was given, Jeremy, all right, the Bible says sin was in the world until the law came, sin was in the world. Okay, in Romans, think about it. Before the law was given, men lived hundreds of years. I mean, these were sinners. They, 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 they had sin, but they were not condemned. They, they didn't feel condemned for their sins. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you that, that people, without the law, without the sense of condemnation and guilt, they live hundreds of years. 
Guess what's going to happen? We remove the law from the body of Christ. Yeah. Longevity will be restored. Amen. That's been a major theme in this ministry, as you may know. Uh, uh, my grandmother, Gloria, she's has been preaching heavily al along those lines. We talked about this, but in Psalm 90 and people thinking, well, that's what God's given us 70 or 80 years, mm -hmm. but that that's not for us, is it? That's not. If you read the context of that passage, Psalms 90 talks about uh, uh, the days of our years. If you turn to it real quick, uh, in Psalms 90, the Bible is very clear. It tells us that um, the days of our years, you know, be 70 years old, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, here it is, okay, in verse, uh, Ten. The days of our lives are 70 years. If by reason of strength, they are 80 years. But look at the context. The verses before that talks about your wrath in verse 9. Your wrath. Mm -hmm. The days of our, uh, have, our days have passed away in your wrath. Look at the verses after that. Verse 11. Who knows the power of your anger? All right. So it's your wrath. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like uh, Israel in the wilderness was under God's wrath. Okay. So they live only 70 to 80 years because the sense of God's wrath. Imagine people under the sense of God's wrath yeah. or an authority figure, even a parent. If a parent has that sense of, you know, you feel like your, your, your father is always angry at you. It can have an effect. I know of, of, of children that grow up sick, having an incurable disease or whatever because, now they're adults, but they don't, don't know where it came from because of the sense of anger in yeah. their lives. Imagine we free the body of Christ from this falsehood. The yeah. next psalm will avail for us. The next psalm is for us. With long, long life, life will God satisfy us. Praise That's the Lord. for us. Hallelujah. Will you, we've got just seconds left on this broadcast. I want you to pray the prayer of faith. There are people watching this believing God for healing in their body, and today is their day to receive that. We pray. Yeah, I'll gladly. Now, friend, I want to proclaim to you that all your sins are forgiven. I know it because if you believe in Christ, I know from the Word of God that your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Will you kindly do me a favor, please? Will you forgive yourself before I pray for you? Will you say in Jesus' name, if your name is George, say, George, I forgive you. Of all the stupid things you have done, I forgive you. Some of you are kicking yourself. You are hurting yourself. You are beating yourself up. You need to forgive yourself. It's as much, you know, unforgiveness not to be forgiving yourself. So, friend, I feel like many of you, uh, you are hurting yourself. You are beating yourself. And that's why... This sickness has come because of that sense of condemnation, that sense of guilt. You are punishing yourself. But look away from self to the cross. Look at what Christ has done. His beating was your beating. His condemnation was your condemnation. So friend, right now, I declare you completely forgiven you, of all your sins. Receive that love. Receive that forgiveness from God in the name of Jesus. And I pronounce your body in the name of Jesus. Heal whole and complete Thank you. in the name of Jesus. Why? Because God loves you. In Jesus', Jesus. name, amen. 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 Praise you. Come to a Kenneth Copeland Ministries event. The 2014 Branson Victory Campaign, February 27th to March 1st with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at Faith Life Church in Branson, Missouri. The 2014 Southwest Believers Convention, June 30th through July 5th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their special guests in Fort Worth, Texas. The 2014 Washington, D.C. Victory Campaign, November 13th through 15th with Kenneth and Gloria Copeland at the Hilton Memorial Chapel in Woodbridge, Virginia. Partnership is the anointing of increase. Just like in John 6, where the little boy's lunch was received, blessed, and distributed through the hands of Jesus and his disciples to feed more than 5,000 people, so it is when your gift is placed in ministry hands. God's way is for seed to come into the ministry, for the ministry to receive it, bless it, and distribute it, then for it to go out, multiplied in greater numbers than when it came in. That's the anointing of increase. We get the benefits of it because we're part of the ministry, because we get the anointing that's, that's on that ministry hat. It's flowing in our lives. The anointing that is on the men and women in the five-fold ministry offices can be transferred to any believer through partnership. You're not putting enough faith pressure on it, you hear me? You need to put pressure on that partnership. Not pressure on me, pressure on the partnership, pressure on the Word. Amen. I'm a partner in this ministry, and I believe for every anointing that's on Kenneth and Gloria, the purpose of the anointing of increase through partnership 
is to accomplish something that neither the partner nor the ministry could ever do alone. What you believe to be true can and will impact the way you live your life. Wrong thoughts produce wrong actions. Right believing produces right living. How do we know what is right to believe? We discover that in God's Word, and the Power of Right Believing package can help. With Pastor Joseph Prince's latest book, The Power of Right Believing, you'll learn seven practical yet powerful ways to finding freedom. When you know you're loved and forgiven, you have confidence to live whole and complete. Your identity can be anchored in Christ, causing you to live stress-free in His rest. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, Spirit transforms us as we behold, not as we strive. As we behold, He transforms us from glory to glory. Kenneth Copeland helps you discover the truly compelling power of God's mercy, as well as the depths of His love and compassion in this book, Mercy, The Divine Rescue of the Human Race. Be transformed in your belief system by the power of His love. Believe right and live free. Order the Power of Right Believing package for only $24 and save over 20%. Joseph Prince's book, The Power of Right Believing, and Kenneth Copeland's book, Mercy, will help you discover the compelling power of God's love and mercy for you. Be free from every addiction and fear and begin living a life in His peace and joy today. Go to kcm.org slash TV special or call 800-600-7395. For an additional 10% off, order your package online. Pastor Joseph Prince mentioned on this broadcast earlier this week that righteousness the righteousness of God is a gift. It's a gift from God to you through Jesus. And that's what makes it His grace towards you. And you need to receive that gift if you never have. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you need to do that right now because in that, when you receive that gift, you are free from sin. You are free from shame and condemnation. And I want you to get free today. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, then just pray this prayer with me. Say, God in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. He is your son. I believe he lived for me. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again for me. And I thank you, Lord, for filling me with your Holy Spirit. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Take my life and do something with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, then you need to know all of heaven is rejoicing with you, throwing a party for you because you came home and everyone at Kenneth Copeland Ministries rejoices with you. And we have a free salvation package that we want to send to you. This is a book called He Did It All For You by my grandparents, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And we're going to send you two brochures on how to study your Bible, how to get into a, uh, reading the Bible and find out what the Bible says about you, what it says about God and who you are in Him. These things will just help you get on your way. Learn to see you the way God sees you. He sees you through the eyes of Jesus. So request your free salvation package today. Go to kcm.org. We'll send it to you. Now, the word of the Lord that came to Brother Copeland about 2014 is that this is the year of our victory over death and the year of God's manifested love. The more you grow in the love of God, the more you will see how much He loves you and then your faith will begin to grow. Amen. Faith works when you know how much you're loved. So thank you so much for joining me on this broadcast podcast today. Pastor Joseph Prince and I'll be back again tomorrow. We're going to be learning more about the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and how to reign in life through him. This is Jeremy Pearson's reminding you once again that God loves you and we love you and Jesus is Lord. I am the Lord. I change not. Everything around us seems to be in turmoil. But praise God, if you're a believer, you have something you can depend on, the unchanging Word of God. If you will make the Word the final authority in your life, it will give you stability when everything else around you gives way. If you'll let what God says settle the issues of life, you'll be confident when others are confused, peaceful when others are under pressure. You'll be overcoming when others are being overcome. Commit yourself to God's Word, and there won't be anything that can steal your security from you. Hello everybody, I'm Gloria Copeland. Billy Brim's back and she joins me again on the Believer's Voice of Victory. 
We're continuing our study on the book of Daniel and then studying the scriptures about God's calendar and the signs of the times. You won't want to miss these special broadcasts. It was such a powerful prayer that Pastor Joseph prayed at the end of this broadcast today. And you need to know that you're forgiven. You need to know that you are free from condemnation and guilt. And above all, you need to know that God loves you. And I hope you receive that word today. I hope you receive that love and the forgiveness that comes from Jesus and through Jesus. And when you do, that's when you will be healed from the inside out. The healing of your body happens after the healing of your soul. And you can be whole and complete. Amen. I'm so thankful that we had that time with him today on this broadcast and all this week. Now, Friday is always offering day on the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. So let me read to you from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 6. It says, let him who is taught the word of God, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And we've had two weeks of outstanding broadcast. Uh, I'm so thankful that Sarah took the time to join us here. So grateful that Pastor Joseph Prince took the time to minister the word of God to us. And if you've been blessed by this, go before the Lord and just say, Father, is there something you'd have me do in response to these broadcasts? And if he leads you to give, then do it, knowing that your partnership is going to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ all over the world. Father, I pray the blessing over every partner, over everyone sowing into this ministry and these broadcasts, I thank you, Lord, for strengthening them and returning to them and causing them to know that their seed has been sown in good ground. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to go back and watch these broadcasts from the last couple of weeks and, and get a hold of what the Lord's been saying to us. You can download them absolutely free on kcm.org. Go back and, and look at the archives of all the broadcasts. Just feed on these things and watch as the Lord works them in you and through you. Now, next week, my grandmother, uh, Glory Copeland, and her guest, Billy Brim, are going to study on these broadcasts as they always do. They're going to study God's calendar and His signs of the times. And you need to know that Jesus is coming soon and our hope is in him. That's why we do these broadcasts because they're going to equip you with the word of God, give you courage to be bold and win souls, praise God for Jesus. So get these things down on the inside and feed on them like Sarah and I talked about, feeding on the faithfulness of God. Feed on who you are in Christ Jesus. Feed on who he is in you and be constantly aware he's coming soon. He's coming soon. He is coming soon. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us on this broadcast this week and all last week. It's been my joy and honor to be your host. Thank you so much. This is Jeremy Pearson's reminding you that God loves you and we love you. And Jesus is Lord. Thank you for joining us today on the Believer's Voice of Victory. To purchase this week's broadcasts on DVD or MP3 on CD, go to our website or call us today. Remember this week's product offer. These ministry tools are designed to help you live a happy and successful life in Christ. Get the Word working in your life and experience all God has for you. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, be sure to request your free salvation package. This will help you understand who you are in Christ and how to start living in victory.